from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Dana Andrews and Millard Mitchell in My Six Convicts. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play is based on that bestseller, My Six Convicts, and Stanley Kramer Productions has turned it into one of the funniest comedies of the season. You know, a few years ago, criminals were sentenced to prison and confined without any rehabilitation. Until one day, a new type of doctor began some interesting experiments. Starring in the role of the doctor, we have Dana Andrews, and co-starring in his, his original role, Millard Mitchell. Yes, tonight's play is a bestseller, and with good reason. I've been especially pleased to receive your letters, praising our entertainment this season. Now, my six convicts, starring Dana Andrews as Doc and Millard Mitchell as Connie. It was in January that I arrived at state prison to take up my duties as psychologist. I had never been inside a prison before. As I stood in the warden's office... I was suddenly aware how uncertain, ignorant, and scared I really was. Now, according to your papers, Doc, they've sent you here to test the men for, uh, for work aptitudes. Yes, sir. You mean what kind of a job a guy is good for? Well, what else? Well, general psychological advice for personality problems, percentile ratings, research. Now, all I'm required to do is supply you with office space, your meals, and convicts, right? Yes, sir. I've had 40 years of prison work, Doc. I still don't know what goes on inside the mind of a con. But I suppose you've had experience with Well, you? no, sir. I, I've been teaching psychology in a college. Uh-huh. Of course, by some fluke, you could get to hear something that might interest me. What the cons are up to, plans for a break, gun smuggling. Well, I'm sorry, Warden, but whatever is told to me is completely private. That's the only way a psychologist can work. If they can't learn to trust me... None I... of the cons are going to trust you with anything more than the time of day. But I'm glad to know how you feel. I advise you to stay away from this office. You see, I'd want to know what you know, if you should happen to know anything. I understand, sir. Now just be careful, Doc. If you make any mistakes in a prison, only God can help you. Now you're on trial here, right? Yes, sir. It's sort of an experiment. Well, I hope you'll be here a long time. Now what I mean is, you'd better be a bright psychologist, Doc, or you'll be a dead one. It was routine for all new members of the prison staff to fill out a personnel questionnaire and to be photographed. One of the guards escorted me to the photography room. What sort of job you got here, Doc? I'm a psychologist. Bugs, Doctor. I didn't know we were getting any. Apparently no one else did. I was quite a shock to the warden, too. Connie, come on, get ready. I'm all set, sir. Just show the gentleman in. Connie works the cameras. He's one of the top kick cons. He's in for opening guaranteed burglar-proof safes. See you later, Doc. All you got to do is sit down on that desk stool. Oh, uh, thanks. Turn around and face the light. You're squinting something terrible. Well, that's a light in my eyes. Yeah. You should have come by train, Doc. You didn't save no dough with that jalopy of yours. Well, how did you know I drove Keep a... it steady, will you, Doc? Why'd you stay at that Hotel Ross in Laurel Lake? A flea circus. It ain't respectable enough for a bug's doctor. Well, just a minute. Who told you that I stayed at the... Don't move. I got to take another one. Uh, what kind of bugging do you do, Doc? Hmm, different tests. What's in a test? If I told you, they wouldn't be any good when you take them. Hey, you need a bug's doctor yourself. You think I'm going to play Patsy to a psycho. How do you know so much about me? You tell me your secrets, and I'll tell you mine. Okay. Go ahead. Ask me. What's behind these tests? What's the angle? Sorry to miss you, Doctor. I'm Captain Haggerty, a disciplinary officer. Glad to know you, Captain. Connie, treat me all right? Oh, real friendly. The doc's mug is now immortal, Captain. And if you'll come with me, I'll take you to Dr. Gordon's office. Dr. Gordon? Yeah, he's our medical man. This way, Doctor. It was incredible. A prisoner, knowing who I was, how I traveled, where I'd spent the night. I looked back at Connie as I walked out. He ducked behind his camera, grinning at me. This used to be a stock room, Doctor. I know it's hardly conducive to scientific research, but... Well, Dr. Gordon, how can I I'm even... I'm sorry, but we're very short on space, and no one told me you were... I was coming? Yes, I know, Dr. Gordon. Something wrong, Doctor? Scared? Disappointed? Both, I guess. 
It's good to be a little scared in a prison. Of course, outside, the scare can be bigger. You're scared you can't pay your rent. You're scared you might lose your practice. There are a thousand fears outside. Here, only one, the fear of violence. I like working in a prison. Life's much simpler. I suppose I could get some painters and carpenters to fix this place up, couldn't I? Oh, sure, that's a cinch. And I'll need a staff, a psycho-galvanic operator, a statistician, a couple of... Sorry, but I haven't any men to spare. Well, I can't very well test a thousand men by myself. It would take years. You'll have help. You've got a thousand men to pick from. A staff of convicts? How do I start? How do I pick them? Oh, they'll pick you, if you're lucky. What are my chances, Dr. Gordon? Do I have any at all? I don't know you yet, so I can't say. But I do know you'll meet with lots of resistance. You see, it's your job to find out what goes on inside their heads. And in their heads is the only privacy a prisoner has. I'm afraid I never thought of that. That's not all. Most of them won't know the difference between a psychologist and a stool pigeon. They have only one solution for stool pigeons. We have stabbings here about once a month, and nobody ever finds the knives. So take it easy, Doctor. Just don't try to rush things. I spent the next few days turning the storeroom into something resembling an office. And for the time being, I forgot about Connie, the convict who knew so much about me. But I soon discovered that only one other man among the prisoners was more respected. A real tough character named Punch Pinero. One day, while the men were in the prison yard... I've been waiting for you, Connie. I've been waiting to hear from you. That nut specialist has been here for six days. My, my, Manzur Pinero can count. I thought that you and me decided that it was your job to finagle his racket. All right, so how do we finagle it if we don't plan a man in his office? Give the doc time. He'll do a bonehead and a warden will give him the uts. Save us all a lot of trouble. Economy of effort, Mr. Panero, that's me. And I say no more waiting. If you don't jimmy in, I will. I have here a document. Yeah? The test that Mr. Squirrel Guy is hoping to give us. I borrowed a copy. Yeah, what's it say? The state test of mental ma- maturity. Study it, my boy. You want to know anything else? Just to check with your Uncle Connie. <laughs> You don't have to escort me to lunch every day. I can walk across a prison yard. Well, if I were you, I'd wait a little while longer before I tried it alone. Remember Dr. Britt? The dentist? Sure. He's been here three years. He still walks with a guard. I guess nothing's safe here. I got two crates of printed matter yesterday. The test I'm going to give them. One of the crates was open. Sure, the boys did that. Well, they could at least have nailed it up again. Then how could they let you know that they know what you're planning? By the way, have you got any assistance yet? No. And tomorrow I test my first group of prisoners, 20 of them. Well, good luck, Doc. Meanwhile, let's get some lunch. Yes, the following day was a big event. My first official contact with the prisoners. It lasted about five minutes. They started by hooting at me, and they ended with bedlam. I finally went to the door and called for the guards. Still want to get in that test, Doc? Oh, not today. Take them back. Now get in line! Get in line, get in line. You should have done like I said, Doc. Half a dozen guards and you'd have had no trouble. I was so sure. I was so sure I could handle them. Okay, you guys, now march. Move! And hurry it up! Hurry it up! Can I come in, Doc? What do you want? I'm Connie, Doc, remember? I took your picture. Well? I just thought you might like one for your sweetheart, maybe, Doc. Here. Some picture. Yeah, I guess you moved your head, huh? Oh, uh, here's my pass. You gotta sign my pass. Uh, how did it go? Okay. Uh huh. Hello? Oh, yes, Warden. Well, I, I guess I just wasn't ready for them. No, I'd rather not have the guards present. Well, because it would make the men self conscious and spoil the test. No, sir, I, I don't know how, but I'll work it out somehow. Yes, sir. Doc, it ain't that the boys got anything against you personally. It's just a question of the war. What war? The war, Doc, between you and me. I'm not fighting anyone. Sure you are. Every prison's a battlefield, I know. I've been in 11 of them. It's us against you. It's a war between the ins and the outs. You're on one side or the other. But I'm not on either side. I'm a scientist. Then go back to your college, boys, Doc. We don't need no head shrinkers here. Now I'm going to tell you something. They ganged up on me. I know that. But I'm going to stick it out, see? 
You can pass that word around on your grapevine. Here. Here's your pack. Okay, Doc. Okay. A couple of days later, just as Captain Haggerty was passing the photograph room, he heard a crash that stopped him in his tracks. All right, Connie, what happened this time? Oh, Captain Haggerty, sir, a terrible accident. Oh, I'm just butterfing. Our $300 camera is smashed. I just don't know how it could have slipped out of my hand. Every time you want a work transfer, you have another accident. You cost this state a fortune. Why can't you just come right out and ask for a transfer? But, Captain, that'd be disloyal to you. All right, Connie, you asked for it. I'm sending you to the bugs, Doctor. Oh, no, Captain, not that. And I hope he finds you perfect material for the garbage detail. I got news for you, Doc. You just got yourself a new chief of staff, me. Really? What's happened to the war between us? I, I changed my mind. I was impressed with your character. Come on. Give it to me straight. Well, you see, Doc, maybe I got the wrong slant. I've been learning my trade from crooks, and I figure if I'm ever going to change... Well, you're a student of the mind, Doc. You know what makes it tick. I don't believe a word of that. But if you're going to work with me, the first thing you'll have to do is take some tests. Here. Take a look at this paper. Oh, swell. This shouldn't be too... Well? It, it, it says this is the, the Otis classification test. That's right. Why? Were you expecting the state test for mental maturity? The, you stole some copies of it, didn't you? you no, know, Doc, you got possibilities. But I ain't taking your test. I ain't putting nothing down on paper. Most of the trouble in the world today is because somebody put something down in writing. But if you don't take them, how are you going to give them to the others? Others? Uh, you mean... You mean I'll be giving these tests to the boys? Well, I can't do it all by myself. Okay, Doc, let her rip. And so Connie, a safe cracker, became the first of my six convicts. A man with a grudge against the respectables of our society. His, I, his IQ was high as the average college senior. I sensed that he was really here to test me, a symbol of the world he distrusted, and to break me. Well, a couple of months went by, but I was still afraid to attempt another group test, even with Connie's help. But if I didn't do something soon, my trial period would be up, and I'd be out. I decided on a roundabout way of showing the prisoners that I wasn't afraid of them. I made up my mind to cross the prison yard alone. I'm getting fed up with you, Connie. It's coming out of my ears. Every time I ask you what gives with the stooly bugs, Doc, you clam up. It's too complex for you, Mr. Panero. Too complex. This is me, see? Punch Panero. Take it easy. Punch, he's coming. Doc, bugs his face. Where's Kopak going? Like Kopak's got something to say to the Doc. Yeah? Well, maybe I got something to say to the Doc myself. So you see, I, I work in the tailor shop now, Doc. But if you get me a transfer, I'd like to work with you. Nobody works for the Doc. What's your name? Steve Kopak. I said nobody works with the Doc. Oh, look, I got less than a year to go. Please. I got lots of problems, Punch. Yeah. You see, Doc, I'm Punch Panero, and the whole world knows it, and these are all my boys. Well, I give them a break sometimes, so it's okay for Kopak, Doc. It's okay. But don't crowd me no more. I don't like guys mooching in on me. It goes for you, too, Kenny. Okay, all right, knock it off. Anybody else do a Kopak? Stay here for me. Well, what's the matter with you, Connie? A mistake, Doc. A mistake. <laughs> Kopak was a submissive personality with an average IQ. He'd been serving a ten-year term for embezzlement, but he was frightened of the world outside, the world he would soon re-enter. Don't you see, Doc? In life, I'm a big failure, so I become a crook. I steal some money, and the very next day I get caught. I'm a big failure as a crook, too. But I get out in December. What have I got outside? What have I... Doc, look, Panero. Hiya, Connie. How at it, huh? Well, if it ain't Friday the 13th. Something I can do for you, Panero? Maybe. What's the book, Connie? It's a study of the morphology of the mental defective. Oh, you don't say. Well, Panero? Well, uh, Doc, all year I've been working on a machine shop, treading pipe, getting, getting me little pinkies all day. See, so, 
So I asked for a week transfer, and Captain Haggerty, he obliges me. You want to work here? With me? Yeah, with you, Doc, only <laughs> I don't figure on working. I just want to sit on some feathers like Connie here. <laughs> Reading them ten-buck books, that's some go, huh, Connie? <laughs> He's a little on the microcephalic side, eh, Doc? <laughs> What'd you call me? Knock it off. Knock it. Doc, is Punch coming in? Well, sure, if his IQ is high enough. Then I'm resigning. Oh, that's okay with me. But, Connie, I'll, I'll need you to give him the oldest test. Oh, that's different. I ain't taking no tests he's given. Well, I'm afraid that's the way it'll have to be. You heard what the man said, Punch. You ought to understand. You still have enough with a lot of hoods in your day. Only this time, I'll be softening you. Yeah? I'll be seeing you, Connie. Why did you have to put me on the spot? I'm saving your headache, Doc. Punch wants in because he don't know what's going on, so he figures if you can't beat another mob, merge with it and take over. Hey, Doc. Hey, Doc, I got a right to change my mind, ain't I? Thanks, Panero. Yeah. If you want to run out, Connie, and leave me to be the Doc's chief assistant all by my sweet self, why, that'll be just ducky. Well, Connie? Uh, I'd better hang around and protect him from his baser instincts. Come on, Mr. Panero. I'll show you the setup. <laughs> Connie, Kopak, and now Pernero. A week later, I was ready once again to attempt a group test of the prisoners. And just before they came in, my three assistants stood around me. Kind of nervous, huh, Doc? <laughs> no, no, I'm okay. Uh, now, you're all going to act as, as proctors, understand? What's proctors, Doc? Well, sort of keeping the men in line, Kopak. Uh-huh, this I'm going to like. But you're not to help them with the answers. And you're not to show any expression of approval or disapproval. How do you want us to look? <laughs> Impersonal, scientific. Huh? By the way, uh, Connie looks at me sometimes. Oh, like this? <laughs> That's perfect. Now, ask the guards to send in our pigeon. Check out the apple, Doc. Give it to you. If you'll just be quiet, I'll tell you what this is all about. Ah, come on! Hey, look, Doc, you're laying an egg. You don't know enough. You you let me take over, huh? Okay, Punch. Go on. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, this is a scientific test, see? Look, on my say-so, the Doc will give out with the instructions in a scientific and personal way, see? So you will kindly shut your big yaps and you'll keep them shut. Now, there ain't everything you don't understand, and if the Doc don't make it clear to you, I will. Now, gentlemen, you will please remove your little caps. I say please remove your caps. Okay, okay. That's better. That's fine. Okay, Doc. Proceed with the analyzing. In a few moments, we'll bring you the second act of My Six Convicts. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Perhaps one of our greatest ambassadors was the humorist, Artemis Ward, who did a great deal to cement the friendship between America and England. In 1866, Artemis Ward arrived in London for a series of lecture tours, although he wasn't in the best of health. After his first lecture, an English newspaper wrote... There is certainly this foundation for a cordial understanding between the two countries calling themselves Anglo-Saxon, that the Englishman, puzzled by Yankee politics, thoroughly relishes Yankee jokes. When two persons laugh together, they cannot hate each other much, so long as the laughter continues. As Artemis Ward continued his tour, in his own humorous way, he criticized both England and America, and the cordial understanding grew between the two countries. Although his health grew worse... Artemis Ward refused to abandon his tour, and he didn't stop until he collapsed in the middle of a lecture. Within a few days, he was dead, at the age of 33. In announcing his death, the London Observer said, Artemis Ward never used his great powers of humor for that biting purpose which is implied in the word sarcasm. He's been a man not only of humor, but of good humor. There is no man among us who does not feel that he is the better for having known him. Since his landing in this country... He was taken by the hand in a feeling of brotherhood between our two countries. So it was that Artemis Ward proved to all America that by helping others, you help your country. 
Now our producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. And act two of my six convicts starring Dana Andrews as Doc and Millard Mitchell as Connie with Sheldon Leonard as Punch. <laughs> Thanks to Punch and Connie, the group test was quite successful. Out of it came proper work assignments for more than a dozen men and another assistant for me, a young fellow named Scott. Oh, it's perfectly true, Doctor. I'm here on a phony rap. The result of gallantry, stimulated by family tradition and uh, <laughs> too much whiskey. I, uh, I protected a young lady who insisted on running over a policeman. You've got to see him pitch, Doc. He beat the sheriff's all-stars last year. A no-hit game. I see you are an artist, too. This is yours, isn't it, Scott? Just a modest bit of doodling, sir. Well, uh, put in for a work transfer. I'll speak to Captain Haggerty. You've taken a kid in with us, huh? He has a very high IQ punch. Anybody takes a rap for a dame, he ain't got no IQ. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, Punch, <laughs> it's you. Scotty drew your picture. Hey, let me see that drawing. Yeah, it sure is you, Mr. Panero. Look <laughs> at this. A rod in each hand scaring a bunch of little kids. That's a lie. I don't frighten kids. I like them. All my life, I like kids. Yeah, what about all those kids whose papas you knocked off? Hey, you... uh, don't... Hey, Punch, I... cut, cut it out. Hey, cut it out. That cutting in his needles. All the time, the needles. I said, let him go. <laughs> What's the matter with you? I got only one thing to tell you, Doc. Don't ever touch me again. And cut out this brawling. That goes for you too, Connie. Like I said, don't ever touch me again. Things stayed fairly quiet for the next couple of weeks. I was able to leave the men alone now, knowing that a reasonable amount of effort would be expended with, well, reasonable results. Hey, Connie, about this book you give me to read, I just read here why I'm here in a can. It's my boys. It was all their fault. My boys, they're all delayed morons. When I get out of here, I'm going to give the whole mob the IQ. Where, Nettley? You're going to be deported. Ah, oh, the dirty filthy... No cussing, Punch. Remember, the doc says swearing is a symptom of certain types of schizo... Uh, schizo, uh, you know... Psychosomatic bookmaking company. James T. Connie speaking. What odds are we giving on a ball game? Ten to one we win, even money to share is get a goose egg, and five to three we out hit them. Okay, okay. Hey, Punch, what? put down Driscoll. Ten bucks on a game. Check. Well, what a quiet little place. Like a library. What do you want here, Dawson? I'm planning on joining the staff. See the Harvard tie? You hang trouble on this joint, and I'll personally... Good morning, pathological bookmaking corpse. Hold the phone. Hey, Punch! Packy wants to know what odds on how many shares get spiked. Well, I tell you, Packy, it's even money to... Knock it off. Dementia Dan's coming. He's got Randall with him. Oh, this is why my phone's been busy all morning. <laughs> wrong numbers, Doc. We had more wrong numbers all day. Well, men, I, I've been getting us a new assistant. You all know Randall here. Ah, uh, uh, sure. Hi. Hello, Hello, Randall. Randall. Uh, get him a desk, will you, Punch? Well, what do you want? My name is Dawson, sir. I had two years in college, and I thought I could be useful, too, like Randall. Well, Randall makes my fifth assistant, and I hardly think... Oh, college man, huh? All right, Connie, line up the test for Dawson. If that's the way you want it, Doc. Any reason why I shouldn't? No. If that's the way you want it. Randall had a sort of hopeless look on his face that won my sympathy from the beginning. As for Dawson, he was a psychopathic killer. Unlike Punch, who was violent in order to gain power, Dawson had killed for the sake of killing the time came when the six were reduced to five. Kopak, having served his term, was now a free man again. But saying goodbye wasn't easy. But I got no place to go. For ten years, this has been my home. Ah, right, cheer up, Kopak. If you need anything, you just tell them Punch Panero sent you. The whole world knows me. Uh, sure, Punch, sure. Now, come on. You got a bus to catch. So long, Kopak. Uh, so long, Dawson. Thanks. You are all my friends. My only friend. What am I going to do without you? Oh, there'll be others, Kopak. I've been in here for ten years, Doc. Randall, ain't you going to say goodbye? Randall? Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah. Goodbye, Kopak. Yeah. So long, Randall. I I'll do my best, Doc. I promise. And it, it won't be as tough as you think. Remember, you're just as good as the next man. Good luck, Kopak. Oh. 
Goodbye, boys. My only friend. I was watching Randall as Kopak walked out. His face had suddenly turned white and started shaking, screaming. I want to get out of here. I want to get out. Shut up, Randall. I want to get out. Let him go, Dawson. I got to get out. Take it easy, Randall. I got to get out. 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 I got to get out. I got to get out. Dawson, there are other ways of stopping hysteria. Yeah, Doc. Uh, that's, it's all right, Randall. You'll be all right. Hey, Connie, call Dr. Gordon. Tell him we're on our way. What about him, Doc? How's Randall doing? Dr. Gordon says there's nothing wrong, Connie, organically. But Randall still can't talk, huh? It's called hysterical mutism. He's lost his power of speech. That's how come you're going to try that hypnotism stuff, huh? All right, Connie. Who told you? Told me what, Doc? I'm doing a hypnosis on him first thing in the morning. Hospital, huh? No, in my living quarters. What are you going to do to Randall, Doc? Try to get him to talk, of course. You do something like that, and a fellow's going to say what's on his mind, huh? Without knowing it? That's right. Uh-uh, Doc. Why not? It's too dangerous. You may hear something you wouldn't want to hear. Get back to work, Connie. I'll be at the hospital. Punch, Scotty. I want a word with you. Did Randall to talk yet? Tomorrow morning. Where? Next door, in the doc's room. If that Jake Dawson finds out that Randall's going to talk... I got an idea. We're going to need help, Punch, from the plumbing repair department. Tell him Doc's sink won't work, his wash basin... And to bring a mic along, the rest I'll handle myself. Randall was an easy subject. Under hypnosis, he was free of the hysteria which had caused him to lose the use of his vocal cords. I asked him several basic questions, among them why he'd been sent to prison. I needed money for my wife. She was sick bad. When they wouldn't give me a mortgage on the farm, I, I hit the man and grabbed the cash box. I almost killed him. What were you thinking about when Kopak said goodbye to us yesterday? My wife. I love her. I've got to see her. I'll kill myself without my wife. Well, doesn't she come visiting days? She lives in Canada. She don't even have enough money to take care of herself and the kid. There's no way out, Randall. Not until your time's up. You know that, don't you? Doc. Doc, i got to tell you something. i got to tell you. You're the patsy, Doc. The front man. Me and Dawson, we're, we're gonna break out, Doc. I've got to. My wife, I, I gotta see my wife. A break? When? I, I don't know. I don't know when. You and Dawson? Who else? No. No, I, I don't want to know anything more about it. Close your eyes, Randall. Go to sleep. When you wake up, you'll forget that you told me anything. Understand? Forget. You'll feel fine. You'll forget everything, except that you're able to talk again. Now, go to sleep, Randall. I knew now what Connie had tried to tell me, his warning about hypnosis. I was going to be the shield when they made the break, standing between them and the machine guns. But there wasn't anything I could do about it. If I ratted, the men would find out and my work would be over for good. All I could do was to watch my step and hope I had some friends. When Randall awakened, I took him to the hospital for a day's rest. Then I went back to my room, and there, a few minutes later, I made a strange discovery. Hey, Connie, come in here, will you? I hear you got the kid to talk again. You've done a great job, Doc. Thanks. I'm going out for a while. While I'm gone, my room could do with a little rearranging. Those files should be closer to my desk. I want the bookcase moved against the wall. I'll be back later. Why, sure. Punch, Scott, come on. You heard what the man said. I was gone most of the afternoon. And when I came back to the office, no one was there. No one except Connie. I've been waiting for you, Doc. I got something to give you. Here. A roll of film? That's right. It's from a recording machine. It's all there, Doc. The whole show by electrical transcription. Every word that Randall told you about him and Dawson breaking out. Thanks, Connie. Who knows about this? Only me and Scott and Manzur Pinero. What makes you trust me now? When you were here before, you found something. A, a few drops of water under my washbowl. At first, I thought it was leaking. Then I found a wire. It led to a microphone. 
Yeah, we borrowed it from a friend in the plumbing department. What's the plumbing department doing with a microphone? Doc, you ask so many questions. Anyways, when you left, I knew you found it. And when you asked me to rearrange your room... Well, I wanted you to know. You're a good student, Doc. I'm proud of you. I still don't know why you trust me. It's simple. When you left here, you took a walk to the library. Then you drove into town to get some gas. You stopped off at the Five and Dime and bought some blades and shaving cream. And then you went... Well, what's that got to do with it? Simple. You never once talked to the warden or the Haggerty. You had a sterling silver reason to stool, and you didn't. I'll bet you even know how much money I've got in the bank. Checking account or savings. <laughs> Can anything be done? I mean, without stooling? Not a thing. I'm sorry, Doc. Okay. I appreciate it anyway. Well, you can show your appreciation by not asking any questions if we're a little late to work day after tomorrow and by giving me and Punch and Scott four passes. Four passes? For three of you? Made out to the bearer and good for the yards and the shops. What do you want them for? We trust you, Doc. You trust us. We'll continue shortly with Act Three of My Six Convicts. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of My Six Convicts, starring Dana Andrews as Doc and Millard Mitchell as Connie, with Sheldon Le- Leonard as Punch. The four passes Connie requested had nothing to do with Dawson's plan for prison break. It was months before I learned that they had used the passes to smuggle Randall's wife into the prison and out again. How they arranged it, I'll never know but it was an operation worthy of the FBI, Dick Tracy, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Hello, boys. Hello. Well, Randall, you're feeling pretty chipper again, huh? What did it? Oh, oh nothing special, Doc. It, it just came over me all of a sudden, Doc. You see, last night I, I thought and thought and thought and... You what? you went over your, your entire situation, huh? Oh, that's just what I did, Doc. And you got you got an insight into your problem and made an adjustment to reality. That's it, an insight. Well, you see, man, that's what psychology does for you. It helps people to acquire insight. Ah, uh, you're so on the nose, Doc. Doc, you're wonderful. I ask you, how does he do it? Huh? Insight, that's what it was. What a fool I must have seemed to them. What I needed was a little insight of my own. Some way, for instance, of figuring out when Dawson was going to make his break. But week after week went by and nothing happened. When everything's got especially monotonous, we could always depend on Connie to give us something to talk about. It started with the warden requesting a special favor. The warden, huh? What kind of a special favor, Doc? Is he going to make me his chief deputy? Uh, something even better than that. A safe got jammed in a bank in town. Huh? Now, tomorrow's the 4th of July. They can't get an expert till the day after. But they have to meet the payrolls today. They want me to open a safe? But, Doc, in broad daylight without, i got to listen for the cops. I ain't got no experience that way. The warden's waiting, Connie. What do I tell him? Okay. I do it on one condition. I want ten bucks, a suit of clothes, and a straw hat, and the rest of the day off in town. Under guard, of course. Otherwise, I don't perform. Uh, you know the warden won't go for that. Oh, uh, look, Doc. I ain't never told this to no one. But I got a 20-year-old kid. He don't know me from Adam, but... I kept a line on him. He's in the Marine recruiting office, and I'd sure like to see him. I didn't even know you'd been married. That ain't the precise point. <laughs> will you will you put it to the warden, Doc? I just want to see if the kid looks like me, that's all. Okay. I'll see what I can do. What did he say, Doc? Well, you've got yourself a deal. You're to report hey, to we the... got company while you was gone, Doc. Is he going to say hello to Kopak? Kopak. Hello, Doc. I- I'm back, Doc. It didn't work. Well, I failed with you, didn't oh, I? Oh, oh, no, it's not you, Doc. It's the world outside. It's too big for one man. And after all this time, I still got no friends like Connie and Punch and you. So don't feel bad, Doc. 
I broke parole to get sent back here. Broke parole? Yeah. It's like I told you. I'm a big failure in life, but I'm a big success as a prisoner. I never want to leave here, Doc. Okay, friend. Your old desk is waiting for you. Connie... You report to the warden right away. Oh, brother, the big city. Lock up your silver and button down your maidens. James T. Connie is on his way. Connie didn't show up that night, nor had he returned the next morning when we came back to the office after the 4th of July ceremonies. Ah, liberty, freedom. Well, who do they think they're kidding? I don't get it. It's the country's birthday party, Punch. Like the first time in your life when you felt you were a man. I was a man when I was six months old. <laughs> Johnny. Hey, what's the matter, Doc? You, you worried about Connie, huh? I told you he wasn't coming back. Who ain't coming back? Hey, I told you he wasn't coming back. It was a dream, boys, a dream. When I left here, I was riding in the front seat of the warden's car, puffing a big cheroot and waking a siren for all it was worth. Yeah, Ooh, that's that's true. True. Sure. Get out of the way for James T. Gunny. Well, all right, all right. So what happens? Come on. Well, we get to the bank. See, the yeah. jo- joint's crammed with legit characters wearing vests and pinched noses. Yeah, yeah. Tearing my eyes away from a blonde stack of wheat cakes and oh. figuring I got to make a deal with the suckers before and not afterwards, yeah. I says to the big cheese, uh, get me a chair, will you? Punch a more out. Yeah, sure. Give me a chair. Yeah, 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 this one here. Sit down, Well, honey. thanks. I says... Look, cousin, I get out in about three years. Now, how about me coming back and collecting about a hundred bucks for this job? A kind of honorarium. It's for a hundred bucks. When he says no, I says, okay, cousin, have it your way. So, I hand him my straw hat and begins the modus operandi. Don't use no torch, no soup. And get my clothes all dirty. (laughs) Besides, it's a kick. A baby could open it. What happens is that a screw slips on a time lock when they close it up the night before. This they don't know. But all I got to do is kill a little time and wait until I hear her click. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I pretend that my fingers are a little out of practice and I need some help. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. says, only the blonde has got long enough fingernails. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Well, oh, she don't mind too much and it ain't inconveniencing me none. I'll bet. So the two of us snuggle up to it until I hear the click. Yeah. Then I tell the boys to go in and get their Missoula because I got to fix the time lock so that they can lock it up again that night. Yeah. Do you know something? What? I had a feeling that those fellas were going to be just an even, exact, precise hundred bucks short that night. (laughs) (laughs) The hundred bucks, I believe. The blonde dame, no. Me, neither. That's exactly what I figured. Well, just a minute, Connie. That that adhesive tape on your forehead. How did you collect that item? Well, it's like this. After a little while, I figured I need some solid food. I didn't care what it cost. I had oysters, fried, raw, and stewed. Rare prime ribs, an inch thick with a plank porterhouse on a site. And four different kinds of cake. Not forgetting the wine and other such liquids. <laughs> and then comes the piece of resistance. I calls the waitress over, and I rises politely. I gives her all the dough I have left, which takes care of the tab, and a large honorarium. <laughs> then I says, baby, will you return a favor? She says, well. And I says, will you give me a kiss? Now, she she ain't the given kind. So I establishes my identity, explaining that the world is full of septics who don't believe nothing without evidence. And that it wasn't the kiss that counted, it was the lipstick that counted. Oh, well, the evidence. Where's the evidence? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah, where okay, it? Doc, you may now remove that hunk of adhesive tape. Huh? Hey! hey. Ah. When they bumped out my stomach last night, I fought like the devil to keep him from washing this off. <laughs> And now, you sceptical cons, let's get on to, to work on those correlations. Well, say, Connie, what about your son? What son? The boy you were telling me about. Why, Doc, I ain't got no family, honestly. Are you feeling okay? No hallucinations? No, Connie. Just an occasional delusion of grandeur. Well, when you look in your room, you're going to find something to fix it. You see, I know the boys don't feel so comfortable you wearing that same suit all the time. It's all paid for, too. Well, thanks, Connie, but I can't accept that. That's against the rules. I know, Doc. You keep the rules. I break them. Hey, Doc, can I see you over here for a minute? It's important. It was Dawson. He was standing near the door. He had just taken something out of a filing case. A gun. This is a break, Doc. You give me away and I use the gun. Dawson. Dawson, think it won't work. It'll work. Let him alone, Dawson. Shut up. And don't any of you others butt in. You coming, Randall? No. No, I told you long ago. I, I changed my mind. Suit yourself. That walking, Doc. Uh, you could have put the finger on a dentist. That jink gets kicks out of pulling teeth. I've got nothing against Doc. He's just handy. Let's go, Doc. We gotta save the Doc. We got it. Well, how? How are we gonna? We ain't stoolies. We can't call a warden. I should have warned him. I should have warned him. The question is, how are we gonna get him off the hook without ratting? 
What's Dawson's plan, Randall? Well, he's picking up Johnson and two others in the yard. They all got guns. Then to the auto gate. The ambulance will be there. The driver's in with him. And they use Doc to get through. We got maybe three minutes. Listen, you mugs. This is how we'll do it. Me and Punch. That's only the chow whistle. Come on, I'll give you the layout on the way over. With Dawson's gun in my back, we were walking toward the auto gate when Connie stepped out from the tool house. In back of him were Kopak, Punch, Scott, and Randall, and the prison dentist, Dr. Britt. We swap you, Dawson. The tooth pulling for Doc. Get out of our way. Come on, boys, make the swap. Yeah, sure, what's the diff? No diff. We'll take them both. Now beat it. Stand where you are. Haggerty in the guard. Give it to him. This is your last chance. Drop your guns. Put up your hands. Come on, get it, Haggerty. Looks like we got them all, Captain. Yeah, how many hit? One winged and two dead over there by the shed. Okay, march them all to solitary. Captain, we had nothing to do with this, honest. That was the truth, Captain. All we Shut did up. Was... Just a minute, Captain. These are my men. They were they were trying to help me. That's right, Haggerty. Like I said, Doc, I had nothing against you personally. Thanks, Dawson. Which men are yours? Panero, Connie, Scott, Randall, and Kopak. Kopak? Doc, where's Kopak? Kopak's dead. He was right in the line of fire. Kopak. Can I take my men now, Captain? Okay. Take your men. That winter, my work at state prison was finished. My successor was a man named Hughes. Poor Dr. Hughes. Such confidence. So many wonderful ideas for rehabilitation. But just as inexperienced with convicts as I had been. Plus the added liability of a mustache. Oh, I'm extremely grateful, Doctor, for your concern. But I can assure you that my social work has taught me how to handle unfortunates. Well, I'd like you to meet some unfortunates. My staff, Doctor. Gentlemen, this is Dr. Hughes. Doctor, this is Mr. Pasquale Pernero, James T. Connie, Mr. Clem Randall, and Mr. Blivin Scott. All right. Now, men, I will do my best to follow in the steps of the good doctor. There will, of course, be some changes. Maybe difficult for you at first, but I think Doc, that I can... is a mustache a symptom of a malfunctioning ego or a superego? <laughs> you are a jake, honey, because everybody knows that it is a neurotic compulsion. <laughs> now, now look. I happen to wear a mustache because I... On the other hand, I... gentlemen, it could be a fetish. Or a, a fixation on a prenatal experience. Yeah, maybe his mother had a mustache. <laughs> now, according to Lombroso... I we... wasn't lumbago, it was Aristoteles... As you see, Dr. Hughes, my men are students, fearless and outspoken. Yes, yes, I see. You know, it could be that a fellow's girl might like him with a mustache, you know. You mean that redhead you got stashed away in town? What? How did you know? I'll explain later. Randall, take Dr. Hughes to Dr. Gordon, please. I'll be up a little later, Doctor. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, thank you. I'm hoping you're all going to stay on here with Dr. Hughes. I'd love to, Doc, but Haggerty wants me back taking the pictures. I forgot to tell you. And me, I, I uh, put him for the library. I'm going to work in the hospital staff. Randall, too, Doc. I wish you'd stay on. This fellow's going to need a lot of help. You can say that again. Yes, yeah, sure is too bad. Well, I've got to finish packing. Get off my foot, Punch. Oh, what's the matter with you? I didn't even touch you. Ah, I'm full of it. Why don't somebody go in and say goodbye to the doc and get it over with? Scott, you go on in and say goodbye. Okay. What are you so sore about? One by one, they came in to say goodbye. First Scott, then Randall. You know, I have to tell you something, Doc. I was in on the break with Dawson. I, I mean, I planned it with him, and then I backed out. I'm glad you did, Randall. Well, it was partly because of you and because of something else that happened. You see, my wife was... I'd like to tell you about it, but I can't. Well, getting inside sure helped, didn't it? Yeah. Great thing, psychology. So long, Doc. I'm going to see your wife. I'll give her your love. Oh, thanks, Doc. Hey, you can count on my plugging along with the new guy. No use wasting what we did. Scott's going to stay on, too. Thank you, Randall. Okay, Punch. Go on in. Well, Punch, good luck. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hey, look, I... I changed my mind about that new squirrel with the mustache. <laughs> Somebody's got to line them, and, well, them, them other jakes, they're all running out. Thanks, Punch. 
Yeah. Hey, look. Sometime you come to Italy, eh, Doc? I'll set you up right there. Uh, big castle, lots of dames. And all legit, Doc. I'm I'm through with the hood, see? I got plenty of dough. I don't need nothing no more. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, you come to Italy, eh? You just ask for Punch Panero. Everybody in the world knows Punch Panero. <laughs> I remember that last walk out across the yard to where my car was parked. I remember trying to figure out why Connie had avoided saying goodbye. And how grateful I was that at least some of my men had learned to be loyal. Not to a gang or a leader, but to a job. And in a small way, to society. Yes, I had hope for their future. Hey, Doc! Hiya, Doc! Connie, what are you doing out here? Seeing you off. I fixed it with the warden. Well, I was kind of wondering. There ain't no justice, Doc. Took me all this time to get you nicely broke in and you take a powder on me. And now I gotta start all over again with that mustache cup from the Harvards. Then you're going to stay on with him. Who else can do it? Well, drive slow, Doc. I don't want you to get no ticket. Right, you, you've got the wrong car, Connie. Uh uh-uh. uh. Me and the boys. Oh, now wait a minute. A new car? I told you before, it's against the rules. I can't accept this, Connie. But it's uh, legit. Bill of sale and everything. The warden checked it all over. He... I'm not taking it. Then you're going to have to walk, Doc. We had to turn in your old car, and I got no idea where it is right now. So if I were you, I'd no. just... So long, Doc. I'll keep my eye on you. And if anybody don't ever treat you right, why... In the years that followed, I heard from them all now and then. They dropped me a line or send a message, and they always asked the same question. Are they treating you okay, Doc? Fine, my friends. But how's the world treating you? All of you. In a minute, our stars will return. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Ever heard of Billy Brown? Well, for over a year now, young Billy, a high school senior of Yorktown Heights, New York, has broadcast a 15-minute program over the voice of America. Every Friday, in answer to some letter from a pen pal, he talks about such varied subjects as sports, stamps, religious freedom, and American jazz. The program is repeated in Urdu, a language spoken in India and Pakistan, and beamed to Asia. In one month, Billy answered 627 letters from 35 countries. When one pen pal asked about student government in American high schools, Billy Tape recorded a five-minute student meeting in his school. For a while, it looked as if Billy's program might be discontinued, but it had become so successful that the local Rotary Club set up a special committee to raise funds for its continuation and for the purchase of postage and stationery so Billy could continue to correspond personally with his overseas pen pals. Recently, Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S. and his family visited Billy at his home for a weekend. And later, the envoy invited the Brown family to Washington, where Billy received a reward for his, as the citation read, contribution to the growing spirit of brotherhood between the youth of America and the youth of Pakistan. Although Billy Brown plans to enter law school, he hopes to continue with his radio program, for, like so many other Americans, he's discovered that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are coming forward for a curtain call. Dana Andrews and Millard Mitchell. (laughs) Well, we're delighted you boys got off with such light sentences. Yes, that prison work is a little too confining. We all agreed on that, Dana. Millard, may I welcome you to the radio theater? Thanks, Irving. I've enjoyed it immensely. Don't miss Stanley Kramer's new production of Four Posters. Starring Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer. It's a honey. I saw you at the preview, Millard, and I agree. It's a wonderful comedy. Yes, indeed. And Dana, I've heard, raves about your exciting new Columbia picture, Assignment Paris. Oh, thanks, Irving. It's very exciting because it's founded on today's headlines, the efforts of a newspaper man to free an American held on false charges for the communists. That's as timely as our play for next week, Dana. Because it's the story of the fight against communists on the home front and the tragedy and anguish suffered by a family when one son is discovered to be under the investigation by the FBI. It's paramount stirring drama of My Son John. And as our stars, John Lund, Faye Bainter, and in his original role, Academy Award winner Dean Jagger. That'll be a great show. 
Good night. Good night. Good night, and thanks for a wonderful evening. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Sheldon Leonard as Punch, Peter Leeds as Randall, Marvin Bryan as Scott, Jack Crucian as Kopak, Herb Butterfield as Dr. Gordon, James Nusser as Dawson, Bill Johnstone as the Warden, and Robert Griffin, Dan Riss, and Chester Stratton. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. The Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Thank you.